So we will continue with the theme of nonlinear geometry in uh, neural data. And I will present uh, an argument for hyperbolic geometry in the olfactory system. And we will look at two aspects of the olfactory system. One is the input to the olfactory system, the natural orders, quote unquote natural. Of course, there's always a question of what we define as natural, but in our case, we looked at orders produced by plants, such as strawberries, blueberries, and tomatoes, shown here, as well as some from, from mouse sources, from animal sources, and then um, human perception. So I would like to, as the start of the talk, I would like to describe our reasons for looking for hyperbolic geometry in the data. So there were roughly two reasons. They're overlapping. One is that if we think that, you know, in any sensory system, what we are getting is um, the, the result of some underlying process. It's the same thing is true in um, vision or olfactory or auditory processing. But in olfaction, what we observe are molecules. and these molecules are produced by metabolic processes in a plant. And there are, although there are many genes and in principle large number of programs, in, in practice, we would think that there is actually a small number of decisions that a plant can do. So it can, um, for example, decide to grow if it feels that it's been overshadowed by um, other nearby plants, or it can decide to invest in chemical defenses. Uh, maybe some antibacterial or antifungal pathway will be turned on. Uh, or there in a fruit, there can be a ripening uh, pathway. So what we observe um, with our um, senses are molecules. But in reality, and what we are interested in when we choose a fruit or um, choose other food also, we are interested in what's inside. So what was the underlying process that produced those molecules? So if we have, a, um, in many aspects of biology, the underlying process is hierarchical. And if that is true, then the hierarchical process that is unobserved, but what we observe is the endpoints of that process, then the underlying space will be to the activity of the network that is observed will be hyperbolic. So that's um, that's one of the um, motivation for uh, looking for hyperbolic geometry. And recently, uh, many people have um, shown that for embedding hierarchical data, either it's in visual or auditory domain, it works better if uh, using hyperbolic geometry, in part because you have an exponential expansion of states and therefore uh, you can represent tree-like data as in visual natural scenes better with these spaces. So that's uh, one motivation. And then another motivation is that it turns out that if we have a network that conforms to a hyperbolic geometry, then you can communicate efficiently between parts of this network using only local information. So for example, of what this means was uh, presented by uh, Krukov and collaborators in this um, Nature Communications paper, where they studied um, the connections within internet. And in the internet, if I want to send a signal from one node to another, in principle, to find an optimal path, I would like to, or I have to know pure connectivity, full connectivity between nodes in the network. But that's uh, difficult to do because the network is changing and I have to download to each node the global map of the network. Instead, what they showed that if um, the network conforms to the hidden hyperbolic geometry, then I can assign coordinates to each node uh, hyperbolic coordinates to each node, and then I can send information from one node to another node only 
uh, I don't need I only need to know the target coordinates and coordinates of my neighbors and then closest along the geodesic towards the final coordinates and they showed that using this routing you can achieve uh, uh, good performance using local in local information and I think this is relevant for biological networks because in biology the connections are changing constantly and so it might be a good feature for uh, biological networks to have. So those are two motivational points and now I would like to present evidence that we think that natural orders are have low dimensional hyperbolic geometry and the same is true for human smell perception. So this will be the bulk of my talk on the first part and uh, more on the and a short section on human perception. So the distance between molecules and how to define them has been a long-standing, uh, a matter of long-standing debate. You can define them in many different ways. For example, according to uh, how much hydrophilic these molecules are or how heavy they are and what is the length of the carbon chain. And at least in the case of the neural space, the, these uh, properties are somewhat correlated with neural parameters, but also leave uh, um, open the possibility that the organization is random. So instead of looking at the chemical properties, we wanted to look at statistical definition of distance, and that goes back to the everyday use of olfaction. So we um, I smell a sandwich and I would like to know whether it's worth eating it or not. So through experience, one can learn that if it smells a certain way, that maybe that contains poisonous bacteria and we shouldn't eat it. So the correlational uh, distance between um, molecules, statistical distance. So in the start point was a data set of strawberries. And they look at different genetic varieties of strawberries. And each uh, strawberry, each genetic uh, variety, was measured at their ripe point uh, with respect to approximately 80 monomolecular orders. So in this case, we have, um, I'm just showing you a segment of a matrix where you have samples from the environment, if you will, uh, right now only limited to strawberries, but in principle uh, can be expanded to other situations. And we compute the uh, distance between molecules in a statistical way, so according to correlation. If they are more strongly correlated, then we assume that they are derived from the same underlying process, and therefore they will be assigned a smaller distance. Exactly how um, the exact form of this function um, will not matter too much, thanks to the methods that were developed by Vladimir and others. Okay, so that's a sort of a key point, and I would like to maybe pause here and um, ask if there are any questions about how distances between molecules are defined. So once again, this is um, defined by taking a correlation between um, these measurements, which are obtained by gas uh, GCM measurements, and um, so if the two molecules are correlated across samples, then they assigned a smaller distance. So, okay. So now we have a set of distances between molecules, and now we would like to know what surface they fall into, or what is the low dimensional representation. And of course, it's a long, challenging problem of nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So we would like to approach it in two steps. First is to ask what is um, a global organization of the data. So that's similar to the um, persistent homology techniques that were mentioned by Ben. But roughly, what are the, in broad strokes, what's the organization? So we take the distances, and um, as an intuition, I can allude to the example of imagine that you have distances between major cities on Earth and you would like to know what is the geometry. 
So if the distances are from nearby uh, parts in the world, you can say, well, it's locally flat. But if we start um, including distances between cities that are on different continents, then these distances will not be consistent with um, uh, flat geometry and will imply a spherical geometry. So this is the same idea. We take these distances and ask, what is the global approximate geometry that is consistent with these measurements? So this one, one can, for example, we can take a distance matrix from strawberry data. So in this case, it's a, an example matrix here between a segment of the matrix between six molecules and uh, generate the distance matrix from a variety of geometric models. So we will take the same number of points as in the experiment and generate um, the distances and maybe sample it a few times and ask whether the statistics of these matrices is similar to the statistics, um, statistics of the distance um, matrices observed in the data. So I, I think that was a um, similar approach that uh, Ben mentioned in his talk. But here we used, um, instead of taking, you know, one can do it in a number of ways. One can take, for example, um, a difference between these matrices, but that would be subject to nonlinear distortions. So here we followed the method that um, Vladimir developed together with collaborators um, from Gustin PNAS 2015. So roughly the idea are very, uh, it's uh, very convenient for me to go after Ben's talk. So it's, um, you threshold each matrix at a given level. And if the um, correlation is stronger than a set of data, then you assign a connection. And if it is weaker, then there is no connection. And then this network is evaluated according to the number of cycles it has in many dimensions. So it's um, very similar to uh, the persistent homology technique. So in this case, this is the figure from Vladimir's paper showing that we have a number of cycles that um, interestingly increases with the order. So this is, um, so now it's a curve. So the, to make the method independent of a particular choice of the threshold, um, the threshold is varied and with it the edge density also varies. So the general feature of the data is that um, initially the network is not connected. So there will be zero cycles in any orders. And then as you allow more and more connections, the number of cycles grows and then goes to zero because the network becomes fully connected. But exactly how this curve rises and how it falls will indicate if there is any clustering in the data. So maybe, um, and in a way, it will also reflect the geometry. So in Vladimir's paper, they studied um, Euclidean geometries of different dimensions and showed that hippocampal data is not consistent with the random measurements. In particular, you can see that the peaks of these curves increase if it was a um, random geometry uh, with Betty order, and they clearly decrease in neural data. So our approach was to repeat the same analysis, but in the hyperbolic case. So then we will compare, for example, the integral of this curve um, to the integral of the curve when this procedure is applied to data. So that's another way of answering, addressing the question of what is uh, significant, uh, you know, persistent homology, is it persistent enough or not? So instead we can look at the integral and the shape of the curve altogether. So here would be one exa hypothetical example that um, the integral of the curve for the cycles in dimension one will be here, um, uh, dimension two, dimension three. We do not look at higher dimensions for reasons that I can um, go into the during the question and answer period. But the ideal case would look something like this, where you have a measurement from the data, and then you have a set a range that you would expect if you sample this set of points from. Uh, from a given geometry that 
uh, one hypothesis might be true. So, uh, and if they match, then they match, and if they don't, then you can rule out that arrangement. So looking at the strawberry data, if we consider spaces of constant curvature, which of course is an, an, will be an idealization of the real situation, but for constant curvature, there are only three possibilities. You can have a spherical geometry with a positive curvature, you can have Euclidean geometry with zero curvature, and you have a negative geometry, uh, negative curvature in hyperbolic geometry. And so for these geometries, you can vary the curvature in addition to dimensionality. In Euclidean spaces, you just vary dimensionality. And um, also in the hyperbolic geometry, you can vary the curvature. And it will affect the um, how curves behave. So we are, of course, interested in this uh, scenario. And we found that, that indeed it matched the data. And we could rule out these arrangements um, of points. So for example, with uniform sampling. So if um, this is the same data from the strawberry is in the triangles, and in um, if you say take a two-dimensional spherical surface, then the integral of the Betti curve will not be consistent with the data, and the same is true for Euclidean dimensionality in across a range of dimensions. But in the hyperbolic case, you can get a match, and the match that we got was when hyperbolic geometry was three-dimensional. It had a certain value of the curvature, which in our units was seven, and um, um, and then it was consistent with the data. So then you can follow up in more detail about how exactly the points were distributed in that space, and I will be showing that data in um, um, in a few slides. So before I do that, I wanted to show that the results generalize across data set. So originally. I asked the Yuan Chen was the student who um, tried this analysis to analyze the strawberry data. And um, we found that the hyperbolic geometry matched in terms of the integral, but not the Euclidean space. And then he came back and said, well, there are more data sets. There is a data set of mouse urine, um, blueberry, and tomato. They all have different number of points, approximately between 40 and 80 um, measurements of different molecules in each of the data sets. These data sets are partially overlapping, of course, not between strawberry and, and mouse urine, but between the fruits, they are overlapping. So it was curious that uh, approximately the same geometry in three dimensions and in with the approximately the same number uh, curvature value accounted for the data. And one can characterize this curvature as approximately the branching ratio of the network. So we could say that the complexity of the network that generated this data was similar for strawberry, um, mouse, blueberry, and tomato. So that was different amounts of uh, small noise added to the data, which I think um, to account for experimental errors. So now we would like to visualize it. So this one. Uh, you know, topological tool provides a quick assessment of whether the data is consistent with the given distribution, but now we actually want to see the points in that space. So here we use a um, multidimensional scaling together with the hyperbolic metric. So, so instead of, we know that it's a three-dimensional tree, and we are going to represent this tree using a construction known as the Poincaré sphere. One can roughly think that this sphere um, is an overlap of, um, of a tree. So the distance, if I want to compute the distance between two points in a tree, I should go towards the center of the network and then back out. So in the Poincaré ball now, which is filled, the distance between points that we derived would be like between any of the two candidate molecules will go, the geodesic will go towards the center of the sphere and then back out. So this is to emphasize, I mentioned that we think that the spherical space is not consistent with the data. And here I'm using a sphere to visualize the data. This is, um, geodesic is drawn to emphasize that this is not an ordinary uh, sphere. So we do not compute the distances along the sphere or as a straight line as if it was 
um, Euclidean space, but we compute the space according to this um, um, shortest distance or according to the hyperbolic space. And you can see now uh, these points, each point is a molecule, and the distance between them reflects how uh, correlated they were in the natural world. So we can also see, it, I'm showing it in three dimensions, such that you can see that all the points are distributed on a shell in this space. So the space is approximately even, you can say, two-dimensional. And the biological interpretation of this finding was that we are observing molecules that represent the final product of the metabolic activity. They are volatile molecules, and therefore, because they are flying away, they are not combining and making, um, causing chemical reactions to, to new products. So roughly, they are all at the same. Um, there are no points that are um, in the middle that correlate with both, um, you know, with two or more end products. So now there is a first link to perception comes if we combine the data from, say, strawberry and tomato, because they're overlapping, have a set of overlapping anchor molecules. And then you can color. So even though the position of the points is by how correlated they are, and the uh, color of the points is how um, their concentration was correlated with a human pleasantness index. So one can see that there is a clear topography here with um, kind of all points around this pole of the most pleasant fruit is um, this is sort of the pleasantness axis that would be the olfactory coordinates of the most pleasant fruit for across different humans. But of course, you know, even though these are all molecules, presumably more or less pleasant, but um, you would see the region that is um, um, has higher pleasantness value and there is an opposing region of less pleasantness value. Now, another question, because this space is um, curved and closed, you can um, look for other directions in that space that correlate with whatever property you would like um, to test. So we tested um, acidity of the sample and um, boiling point. So how easy that um, molecule evaporates, related also to the molecular weight. And in that case, we can, these are all significant, uh, statistically significant axes. So the pleasantness axis, if we take a subset of orders, find the axis, and then predict on a new set of orders is has a stronger correlation than in previous work um, by about maybe 10 percent but in in, in all faction that's significant and you have also axes that correlate with uh, boiling point and acidity and so in other words there are these various axes and they're not independent so you can, if I know coordinates on the boiling point and acidity axis, I can predict how pleasant a new molecule will smell, which is one of the open questions in olfactory research to predict how um, something will smell based on its uh, physical chemical properties. And here we have a new set of coordinates to address that question. So now uh, we can progress to follow up more on the human smell perception. So we are switching from the inputs to the rankings that are made by humans. And um, so here we use a different data set. It's uh, by Dravniks uh, from 1985. They used um, 127 odorants. And uh, unfortunately, they were very different from the odorants um, that were in the strawberry. And each odorant was ranked by many across more than 100 observers on a number of categories. So you can say in earthy, um, uh, whether it's chemical or natural, whether it smells like mushrooms. So these categories differ in um, how broad they are. And uh, now we would like to use these rankings 
and we will define distance between them according to um, just the Euclidean distance between them. We use the Euclidean distance as opposed to um, correlation because if something is correlated but the rankings are opposite, then um, these um, orders shouldn't be placed into a smaller, closer to each other. So using these, um, um, so before I go into our analysis, I wanted to show you data from a previous work by other groups from uh, Weizmann Institute. I have to interrupt you. We have like four minutes for questions. Yes, good. Thank you. Four minutes. For, so am I completely four done? Four minutes or have... before the next speaker starts talking. Yeah. Okay. So um, some time for questions. All right. So this is data from previous work, and you can see that in even in their representations, you can see the um, evidence of hyperbolas, even though they are not. Uh, in the case of um, Alex's data, they, they did talk about potato chip geometry, so that would be an everyday example of hyperbolic geometry. So now I will just briefly show you data from perception. And uh, we show, we analyze these Betty curves. This is from the data. And you can see that the Euclidean space in three dimensions fits worse than the hyperbolic uh, three-dimensional curve. And we try to max optimize the curve to fit the first Betty value, uh, Betty curve, and then um, test on the second. And one can see that the hyperbolic solid line is a much better fit to the data than Euclidean data. And then here is across dim different dimensions, such that other higher dimensionality is also consistent with the data, but they start to fit progressively worse. And that would be sort of the lowest dimensionality. So now here is the um, hyperbolic MDS visualization of this space. And this, now the space is filled because we think that some of the orders are based on the categories that are observed. They're sort of the generalist orders. They are present um, everywhere. And other orders are specialist orders, such that if you smell that particular order, then you can tell the source and the food source more accurately. So there are differences with respect to natural um, strawberry representation because these include also synthetic orders. So to summarize, we see that hyperbolic geometry describes both natural orders and human perception. Um, there are differences in the organization that in the case of natural orders, it's a shell in this space. Uh, I, I apologize. We have two minutes before the next speaker Okay, starts. so I'm done. I will just uh, thank my group. So this is their hello. And Yuan Shen is right here who um, did this work, and this was a joint work with Brian Smith. Thanks, and I'm ready to Thank ask you. Thank you. So we still have like uh, one minute for questions. So the most important question is from Paul Willemelis Asetunia. I apologize for mispronouncing the name. Almost every graph is hyperbolic. I think that can be attributed to Gromov, but it is easy to say. So is not the hyperbolic geometry almost always true whenever we have data that is written as a graph? Well, I would say that is true. So I would say that uh, the, another way of maybe rephrasing this question, maybe the hyperbolic geometry should be the null hypothesis. And I would agree. Okay, and we are over time, so perhaps the last question, a question from myself actually, is there an independent evidence for a hierarchical organization for factory representations as opposed to just graph with lots of cycles? Other than your work, of course. In your work you uh, do it, but in a very indirect manner. Uh, maybe there is a more direct way to say, okay, there's just hierarchical organization of, of factory representations. Well, I think that people use hierarchical organization to present orders, but um, there was a paper on food orders um, that was studied, but I don't think it was directly tested. Um, yes, and one should I should also add that some amount of cycles 
can be tolerated without the destruction of the hyperbolic geometry. Okay, so let's thank the speaker.